I'm going to speak today on weaning lambs and the animal health considerations and some of the disease problems that you can run into around weaning time. So when I started to think about weaning, um, the process of weaning actually starts way, way back, um, you know, even, you know, when we're planning to get ewes in lamb. Um, so first of all, joining through gestation into lambing, through marking, and then finally weaning. I think weaning is like the icing on the cake, but a lot of the things that are done in the lead up to weaning can influence how well weaning goes and what your weaners look like and what their survivability is. Like. And um, frustratingly, sometimes I get called in to poor doing weaners or weaners that have got disease. And it can be tricky to sort it out because the problems have occurred well back in the, in the process of getting those weaners up to weaning time. So just to give you a bit of an example, um, from the very beginning, genetics plays quite a big part. And I think there's some other presenters that are going to talk more about that. But genetically, um, things can influence um, growth rates, um, the fecundity of the ewes, and, um, and the survivability of weaners. So that's, that's sort of the first thing that comes into play. And then throughout gestation and into lambing, condition score and nutrition are vitally important to lamb survival and then to the health of those lambs moving forward. Lambing time is super important. So you nutrition and nutrition that's spe specific and tailored to whether or not she's a twin or a single or even like a multiple bearing you that's having triplets or quads. Um, yeah, so super important is scanning and using that data to adequately provide nutrition to those ewes uh, to get the, the, the best survival of those lambs and the growth rates and the health that goes along with that later on. And a big influencing factor in that is colostrum and milk quality and quantity. Um, then we move into marking and marking, I believe, is so important and sometimes marking can actually be like a mini weaning and it, if it's done poorly the lambs actually don't go back on to mum very well and are sort of partially weaned so they don't do very well they look a bit tail endy and a bit a bit poor and then they fall over at weaning but the problem was actually started at marking so lots of things are going to influence that so the method of marking the timing of marking whether or not you use pain relief and there's some great products on the market at the moment that can um, be used to make that marking process um, heaps easier on your lambs and have them go back out and do better in the paddock afterwards. Um, hygiene, what treatments and vaccinations you give them, uh, the nutrition following marking, and really importantly, mothering up post marking. So yeah, no, you want those um, lambs in the yards and handled for as short a time as possible and back out drinking well off mum and doing well um, from then onwards. And then finally get to weaning. So, of course, the method of how you wean, when you wean, how heavy or how old those lambs are will all influence success and then nutrition post weaning. And then we get to disease. But, yeah, disease, as I said, is like this is the icing on the cake. So a lot has happened in the lead up to weaning. And when the vet gets called to look at the disease, there's an awful lot of underlying factors that will have influenced the um, the disease in that particular animal. So that's just worth, um, I suppose, thinking about. And I think every enterprise will be different. So there's no one recipe for how to run sheep and for how to get a good weaning result. And probably every producer is going to listen to this presentation and to the other presentations and take something completely different away from it. There'll be a little nugget of gold in here for everybody probably of something they can do um, to make a bit of a difference in their enterprise. And it won't be the same for everybody, just because we're all running slightly different setups. So probably the most common uh, weaner disease that I get to see is weaner anemia. Um, so weaner anemia has got lots of different names. It's caused by a bacteria called Mycoplasma ovus or M ovus. It used to be known as E ovus. So whichever name you use, it's the same disease. And it's a bacteria that floats around in the bloodstream and it attaches itself to the outside of red blood cells. 
So you can see the picture there on the right. Those red, the pale red splotches, the bigger splotches are red blood cells under a microscope. And those tiny little purple dots are actually M. ovus, the bacteria attaching to the red blood cells. And when that happens, the immune system of the animal recognises them as foreign. And so it, it chews up that red blood cell. It says, geez, this is foreign. It can't stay in my system. I need to get rid of it. And so it chews up the red blood cell. And so what you end up with is a very anemic animal. And so you can actually see in that photo on the right that there's not many red blood cells there. Um, and that's because the body's gone to town on it and chewed up all those red blood cells because it thinks there's something wrong with them. So what you end up with is a really anemic animal. So you can see on the left really pale gums. And when you do a postmortem, the carcass is usually quite pale and pretty jaundiced as well. So it can look a lot like Barber's pole um, worm, very similar clinical signs. So typically what producers will notice is they get lambs that lag behind the mob or lay down and are reluctant to move. It usually almost exclusively affects young sheep. So sheep over 12 months don't really ever get affected. It's really young sheep. It can be confused with Barber's pole worm burdens, as I said. And sometimes it's not even noticed on farms um, clinically, but you will get an abattoir report back that reports jaundice. And this, um, this disease can underlie that abattoir report. So yeah, young lambs um, will often present with a recent history of having a management procedure done to them that involves the transfer of blood. So for example, mulesing, marking, shearing, even little things like ear tagging. It's been shown in studies that even the transfer of one infected red blood cell will cause disease. So it doesn't take a lot of transfer of blood in order um, to cause a problem. It's even been reported with uh, biting or sucking insects and flies on wounds. So um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly infectious and incredibly easily transmitted between animals. And it's really common. So we don't really have any data for um, flocks around New South Wales, but a survey of Queensland flocks found that 68% of flocks uh, had evidence of mycoplasma ovus and 90% of Victorian flocks. So it's really prevalent and it's, it's a strange disease. So it's usually seen um, in, the, in the six weeks following a management procedure that involves that blood transfer. And it can occur for the disease course can run its course over about six to eight weeks. So you can get clinically unwell animals for quite a period of time um, following a management procedure. So, um, and it, it, it doesn't happen in every year. And weaners that are generally in good condition without any nutritional stress, they're not mineral deficient, they're not wormy, they've got, um, you know, they're going ahead they will actually withstand the disease and you probably won't see any clinical signs even when mycoplasma ovus is present. Um, their immune systems will be good enough to fight it off and to not show any signs of clinical disease. And interestingly, we didn't see M. ovus through the drought. And while I don't really have any evidence of this, I suspect it was because producers were paying particular attention to the nutrition of sheep and that um, the ewes were better fed and the, the lambs were better fed as a consequence. Um, so it's thought that adult animals are carriers in mobs and that um, those, ca those carrier animals are very difficult to eliminate and... Um, that the ewe, those odd carrier ewes that look clinically normal will spread it to the lambs and then, you know, marking or mulesing or something like that, it'll run through all those lambs who may have a compromised immune system. So it's been reported in the literature that antibiotics, particularly oxytetracycline antibiotics, um, will improve this disease or get rid of it. And the jury's still kind of out on whether or not that's true. In my opinion, um, if you're going to yard sheep with this disease and try and inject them with antibiotics, you're probably going to lose a lot because they are so anemic and they're probably just better off left alone. And we certainly know that the antibiotics don't get rid of it completely. It, it doesn't cure that carrier stage and you won't be able to get it off your farm. 
So, um, yeah, the best the best shot is whenever you mark all mules, leave the animals alone for six weeks afterwards. Just try not to do any other management procedures to them in that period. And um, just simple things like if you're going to shear your lamb, shear them first rather than do your adult sheep first, just so that um, they're shorn in a really clean environment and not after the old animals. And timing procedures, so um, try not to... Uh, mark or mules when there's a lot of black flies around so do it really early back into winter and um, and and just things like that it can be a really tricky problem and um, we do tend to see mycoplasma ovus in certain geographic areas and I don't know why that is um, so yeah something to be aware of and um, yeah and that's common in wieners The second um, wiener disease I'd like to talk about is arthritis. So sometimes these will get arth lambs will get arthritis in one joint, so one big hot puffy joint. Sometimes it's in lots of joints, which is called polyarthritis. And sometimes it doesn't even present as big swollen joints. They just look a bit tucked up. And it, that's usually because I think they're arthritic in their hip joints or their spinal cord, like in, in between their spinal vertebrae in those joints. Um, and the red hot point is that it can be caused by a variety of bacteria. So I've listed a whole lot of bacteria there. Streps, staphs, erysipela, chlamydia, mycoplasma. There's lots of different bugs. Um, most of these bacteria are normal environmental bacteria that are present on the skin, in feces and in the dirt. So again, this is another disease that's everywhere. And it's not about preventing the bacteria as such. It's about ensuring you've got a wiener with a great immune system that it can um, fight off those sorts of bacteria and diseases. So we tend to see it at two different times. We, you can get really baby lambs that are still on mum pre-weaning and, and pre-marking that get it up through the umbilical cord. And then the most common time we see arthritis is after marking and mulesing or after shearing and dipping because there's been a bacterial entry through a wound. Um, diagnostically, chlamydial arthritis is the most common in my area. That won't be true for every area. But the main point is don't just reach for a vaccine. Get a diagnosis first because there's lots of different bacteria and it's worth knowing what's on your farm. And this is just an example of a sheep with arthritis. That's a hip joint. Um, so I've just reflected the back leg there. But you can see the ball joint um, looks a bit rough. It's not nice and smooth. And in the cup joint uh, where that used to be sitting, it's like really thickened and yellow and angry looking and, and doesn't look very nice. So that's arthritis in a hip joint. And in this particular case, the farmer had um, um, mules and marked mid-September. It had rained a lot. The sheep were wet. And um, he lost 40 out of a mob of 500. And it was an unseasonably warm and wet um, September and there were lots of black flies. And we cultured from that particular case a mixed growth of bacteria. So um, choice of lambing paddocks, hygiene at marking and mulesing, the timing of um, marking and mulesing and minimal handling post-procedure is really important. So when I first um, started in my job 10 years ago, um, it was always said that you didn't mark a mule's lambs after the 1st of September in our environment because of the black flies and because of the environmental conditions. And in the 10 years I've been here, that date's moved back roughly to the 1st of August. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it's tough in our environment to, to mark a mule's lambs um, once you get into spring. And so certainly the timing of management procedures in your overall sheep calendar probably warrant some attention due to changing seasonal conditions. And I think that's probably true for managing fly over summer. So, um, yeah, sometimes I go to farms and they they mark and they mules and they shear and things like that at certain times of the year because that's how they've always done it. But maybe that's worth rethinking if you are having issues. The next um, wiener disease I'd like to talk about is worms. So in our environment, and I'm speaking for Canambal, that Canambal area and surrounds, we will mainly see barber's pole um, issues. So for down further south, you will run into trouble with black scour worms. 
And so it really is worth having a chat with your local district vet about what's most important in your areas. But for our area up here, weaners won't need a drench every year. Now we saw that through the drought, most, most weaners in the drought didn't need a drench. Um, if they were done with an effective drench and there was a low worm burden on the farm, generally, the lambs that were born um, because there was very little larval pickup didn't need a drench. And I think I'm going to talk about drench resistance and what our studies have found um, locally here, our local trials have found. That is, um, I mean, using those opportunities where you've got a really hot, bare environment to kill what's in the environment combined with a really effective drench in adult sheep to clean up your worm burden is super important considering our developing drench resistance profiles. So now that, that advice of weaners don't need a drench every year is specific for up here. Further south where it rains more often, you need to probably get some advice from your local vet. But my point is do a worm test and decide. So get, get yourself organised um, well pre-weaning. Do Go out and collect some weaner poo out of the paddock, do a worm test, work out what your burden is. Um, barber's pole worm is the main issue um, and don't focus on tapeworm. So a lot of people get really caught up with tapeworm and end up using a probably less effective drench just because it's one that includes tapeworm. Tapeworm is not very pathogenic in lambs, even when they've got heaps of them in their bellies. So um, yeah, don't focus on tapeworm. Um, do a worm test, work out what species you're dealing with and target your drenches effectively towards that. Be aware of local drench resistance data and consider doing your own trial on your own farm. So we need about 100 undrenched weaners to do a trial. So get in touch with your local district vet and we can help facilitate that. So these photos here are just some barber's pole worm affected sheep. So really pale anemic sheep and um, really that the, the soupy looking picture of intestinal contents if you look really closely are just masses of barber's pole worm in the abomasum or the fourth stomach. So this is um, our trial work that we've been doing. So in 2012 if you look at that first um, column, I mean when I started in this job I naively thought that we were too hot and dry climate and that um, drench resistance was just something that happened elsewhere in a more friendly worm environment. But that's absolutely not true. And if you think about it, we do have a hot, dry climate that fries all of the larvae on the pasture. And so if we're using ineffective or substandard drenches down the sheep's throat, the only worms that can possibly survive that are the resistant worms. So we're, you know, we're, um, we're absolutely sitting ducks for drench resistance. And I've been horrified and astounded by the results that our local trials have shown. So that first um, column is back in 2012. So we, we um, I think we overall ended up doing about 16 farms, but um, I drew these results out when we'd done the trials on 10 farms. Um, so the white drenches on their own didn't work on any of the farms we tested it on. Levamisol was still working really well. Um, there were issues with the mectins, with ivermectin and abamectin not working on any of those 10 farms. Um, moxidectin worked on 44% of farms, um, placental 75%. The organophosphates were really effective. Um, and then we didn't really test um, a lot of the newer or the combination drenches at that stage. Um, we've just started to run another series of drench trials. We've got five farms with the results back that um, I've collated into this next column. So we didn't bother to test the white drenches because we knew last time they didn't work on any of the farms. Um, the same with ivermectin and the same with the organophosphates. So that I don't think there's even a, an organophosphate drench on the market at the moment. But um, this year we found that levamisole is, it's still pretty effective. So it's still working for Barber's Pole on 75% of farms. Um, yeah, ivermectin again, which is really popular, didn't work on any of the farms. Moxidectin is still only effective on about 40% of farms. Clasantil only worked on half the farms. And then because we're in this situation where we realise there's so much drench resistance, we actually started to test some of the newer compounds. So we tested Monipantil, which was it worked on all the farms. Uh, so did Durquantil, Abamectin in combination. 
Um, a triple active worked on 80% of the farms. Um, Clasantil and Abamectin together worked on 65, uh, sorry, 75%. And a white clear combo worked on 60% of farms. So yeah, a drench, not all drenches are equal. And um, what works for you might be completely different to what works for your neighbor. So by all means, look at this data, but it's good if you can run your own trial. And um, yeah, weaners, particularly weaners who aren't doing so great nutritionally and who have maybe a compromised immune system are gonna be particularly prone to worms, especially if you're weaning about now because we're coming into peak barber's pole worm time, which is, you know, like a, a springtime or a summertime, um, especially if we get rain. So um, an effective drench for your weaners, assuming that they need it, um, they, yeah, will absolutely um, benefit from an effective drench. And yeah, best advice, there's so many drenches on the market, um, ring your animal health advisor or yeah, your district vet and get some good advice. And I just briefly wanted to talk about two diseases which um, are flaring up particularly this year and which are kind of linked. So I put them on the same slide. Mastitis um, in ewes. So um, that picture up the top is a sheep's udder. If I, I've incised into it to have a look at the deeper tissues, but you can see that that quarter is really hot, red, painful and swollen. And um, the kidney is actually a septic um like a septic emboli from that mastitis. So that's ultimately what killed the sheep. It was um, shooting out bacterial bacteria emboli all around the body. Um, but we do see mastitis in a season where there's decent feed and where there's a large volume of milk produced. And people get a bit um, keen to leave lambs on longer than they should. And the lambs are bunting the udders. And um, yeah, we, we see mastitis under those conditions. So the, the key for that is to wean the lambs and um, to get them off in those situations. And so, yeah, um, just be careful if you are planning on selling lambs as suckers or leaving them on a long time, uh, you might get mastitis, particularly this year. Um, and related to that is scabby mouth. So we are seeing a lot of sheep with scabby mouth this year not just as lambs in the cradle at marking, but later on at weaning and beyond weaning when they're actually saleable. So um, if, if that's something that occurs for you every year, you might be in a situation where you need to vaccinate um, for scabby mouth. And so that's certainly a discussion to have with your district vet about your individual situation. Not everybody needs to vaccinate for scabby mouth, but some people do. And what we're seeing this year, I think we're seeing so much of it because it has been fairly wet and the feed's been wet, especially animals that have been on crop or something like that. So their skin is soft and, and um, really easy to scratch. And then there is, after the drought, a large amount of spiky feed like galvanised burr, roly-poly, things like that that have grown. So that easily damages the um, lip of the sheep and lets the scabby mouth virus in. The scabby mouth virus will live in the environment, in the dirt for many years. So it can flare up at any time. And then the lamb will go and um, suck off its mother and the ewe can actually get scabby mouth lesions on the udder, which will be very painful. And she'll kick the lamb off early or she'll um, hunt him away from getting a drink. And that may be a detrimental outcome to your weaning as well, because you've got animals that are, that are weaned early and who haven't been getting the nutrition from their mother that they need. So yeah, mastitis and scabby mouth are, are kind of intertwined and um, worth thinking about this year. The key message is get out there and have a look at what's happening in your, in your flock and, um, and keep an eye on how things are looking. So here are my top vet tips for successful weaning. And um, as you've probably already guessed, not much of this actually is related to the actual process of weaning. Uh, a lot of it is to do with, um, you know, pre, well pre-weaning. So don't skimp on scanning for twins and singles. Even in a good year, please scan so that you can adequately feed um, those twins and singles because they are dramatically different in terms of their energy requirements. Feed you use to meet their nutritional needs, and that may mean putting out grain when the feed it looks like there's a good bulk of feed. If it's not green and actively growing, they're going to need supplementation, particularly those twinners. 
think about the timing of your sheep calendar and get your lambing, marking, weaning um, times correct. Use pain relief for marking and mules and you'll get a much better outcome and really good hygiene. Ensure markings as quick and as stress-free as possible and that you're mothering up a new nutrition is really excellent following that so that you don't get a partial weaning. Um, if, you can, if you identify tail enders, identify them and separate them so that they can be priority fed. I didn't talk about pulpy kidney, um, but animals will need two clostridial vaccinations. So one at marking and one at weaning, don't miss that. And they might need a drench. So worm test first and um, choose a really effective drench. So that's it from me. Um, thanks for having me. And um, there are my contact details if anybody has any questions. Good luck with your weaning this year.